It's a real uh, pleasure to be talking to you about uh, industry opportunities with accelerator facilities. As I aren't identified, I'm the technical division head within Darsbury Laboratory, which is 12 miles in that direction. Um, I'm a conventional accelerator developer, not a laser uh, plasma expert. Um, but what I, what I hope to be able to show is how critically important use of accelerators are in terms of industrial opportunities. I think uh, what you've heard this morning already has already identified many different um, requirements um, for particle accelerators that industry can fundamentally take advantage of. Um, so what do we think of when we're talking about particle accelerators? You ask anyone on the street, there's a whole host of things that potentially you may get. You may get a completely blank face. But certainly, industry um, is not large in terms of the spectrum of what they're looking for, what they'll identify. They'll, they'll talk potentially about the large-scale machines, the scientific um, accelerators, LHC, the big machines that are putting a lot of money into developing scientific research. As I say, industry is not something that will be typically prominent. And that's also for the case for accelerator developers. I'm an accelerator developer. Um, I design scientific uh, research platforms. Even for me, industry applications is not on my high um, prominence um, of, of, of requirement. Um, but it is critically important. And as we've seen already this morning, applications of industry-based um, platforms in the medical arena, in environmental sectors, um, in, in development and manipulation of materials, generation of new semiconductor processes. Every piece of electronics device that people have have been processed through a particle accelerator at, at some point in its life. Um, security applications, again, are becoming more and more prominent uh, globally in terms of being able to protect ourselves. Again, accelerators are playing a major role um, in these particular sectors. I'd just like to highlight um, um, two programs that have been running for, well, certainly the one in the US has been running for a number of years. There's also an equivalent program in Europe. There are a number of processes that have been running over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so. But I think these are the, probably the most prominent and recognized um, internationally. Um, the accelerator, Accelerators for America's Future um, was set up by the US DOE um, in 2010. Essentially what they did is they looked at how accelerators were being utilized um, and how society was benefiting from accelerator technologies. It also tried to define a path for those accelerators with industry to see how new technologies would essentially enable new capabilities um, that accelerators could then take advantage of. Um, in a similar way in Europe, um, the um, applications of particle accelerators in Europe that was driven through um, the European Community and the FP7 program on the UCARD2, has done a similar assessment of current capabilities, again, looking at how developments have occurred over the last 10 or 15 years or so, and again, tried to direct what the future needs are from a, from a commercial and industry perspective to take advantage of new technologies that have been developed um, globally. So as I say, these are very useful references to kind of see how internationally and around the world um, the, the utilization of accelerators has essentially evolved. And we've heard already this morning, and many of us will already know um, more, more, more fundamentally, um, is the sectors that, that, are, that are currently being um, focused on with accelerators in the medical application arena, utilizing electrons, protons, and carbon ions for cancer therapy. Um, these are essentially the baseline solution for treating these type of diseases. Um, in, in addition, generating the diagnostics that are needed to pinpoint where these problems occur in the human body. And these various techniques are able to extremely precisely um, paint the way in which these accelerators then um, destroy the cancers within the human body using a combination of these different processes. And, and obviously many leading countries have extensive utilization of these, of these technologies already. Unfortunately, there are many, many countries that don't. And so again, being able to develop more advanced, easier to use, more cost-effective solutions is a key priority um, around the world. 
Security, as I've said, is another global um, um, escalating problem. Um, wherever there's a possibility of hazardous material um, or hazardous um, um, uh, transport of, of things across borders, invariably there's a mechanism to try and protect um, that proliferation of, of undesirable um, devices or components. And invariably, accelerators are then used to scan cargo, to scan individuals, to scan um, planes, trains, trucks, anything that cross borders will, will utilize particle accelerators. Um, and electrons are, 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 are one of the baseline solutions, relatively low energy electrons, that do the vast majority of the scanning of, um, of, of, of devices that come into, into countries. In the energy arena, uh, this is again a very new area of application of accelerators that is becoming more and more prominent in, in leading countries around the world. Um, Carla Rubia, um, one of the ex-directors at CERN, um, developed an idea um, called the energy amplifier and he patented this back in 1995. And this was, was a way in which you could use accelerators with a subcritical reactor to essentially generate um, high, high degrees of, or, or high energy gain in, in terms of product, providing energy um, as, a, as a fundamental capability. Obviously, this process is then critically reliant on the reactor that, they, that you're then using. And his idea was to use thorium, a thorium-based reactor, which essentially would give an extremely high energy gain from the 20 megawatts of electrical power that would needed, be needed for the 10 megawatt um, proton beam to be able to then deliver 600 megawatts of electrical energy. Um, again, you know, a, a major advance potentially um, in terms of en energy production in the, in, the current, um, in the current climate. One of the other fundamental benefits of this process is that it is a sub subcritical reaction. And again, when you compare them against conventional reactors, if you turn the accelerator off, the whole process stops. So it's, from a thermal perspective, it's a much safer way of producing lots of energy um, from, a, from a relatively ro robust platform. And there are now groups internationally developing this um, to the extent where you can fundamentally demonstrate these processes. So the Myra project in Belgium is utilizing exactly the same technique, high intensity proton beam feeding into a subcritical reactor. This reactor is using a les, les, lead bit bismuth reactor, but again, being able to generate um, a, a significant amounts of electrical power as a function of this reaction process. And there are other groups internationally in the process of developing very similar um, demonstrators. Environment is another area where um, constraints and restrictions are becoming more and more relevant, um, and this is particularly prominent for big industries um, who generate invariably lots of potential pollution, um, which obviously needs to be very well controlled. So wastewater and flue gas are two of the key areas that industry um, fundamentally have to address in terms of their product delivery. Um, the big problem um, with large organizations who use a lot of water and potentially contaminate that water as a part of their production process is that they have a very expensive problem to solve. Um, this contaminated water is very difficult to uh, decompose and to dispose of. Um, it's a very complex and expensive process to do with, with um, expensive filtration and osmosis techniques. But utilizing accelerators gives by far a more effective way of being able to break down the constituent parts of these contaminated processes. Um, and there are groups looking at um, large scale implementation of a very simple idea. And that is whereby you essentially expose um, the contaminated water solution um, with, with high power electron beams. Um, and this gives the ability to decompose the constituents of the material you want to be able to recover um, and gives the companies then a better ability to dispose of the waste products. Um, this just shows you a very simple test, a very simple test that we did at Darsbury with one of our electron accelerators. This is using a, a one um, uh, MEV, um, 10 centimeter long um, accelerator. Essentially, um, exposing a textile dyeing solution 
to an electron beam. And very rapidly, you could see this solution, um, which is a purple color, completely changing its, its color as a consequence of that deconstitution of the contaminated solutions. And what we were able to show um, within seconds that we, could we were able to kind of remove a lot of the hazardous components from these material, from this solution. Um, this is obviously just one of thousands of different solutions that need to be treated from an industrial perspective, but it just shows you how, how applicable and how easy it can be to kind of treat these, some of, these, some of these, these problems using particle accelerators. And this same process can be directly apl applicable for flue gas um, uh, problems. Again, lots of contaminants coming th from, um, from factories, um, which can be extracted through um, decomposition using electron beams, and the hazardous components can be more easily precipitated, making it much easier for the company to then deal with from, a, from an environmental perspective. On top of these, which are, are obviously major global problems, every one of those, um, every country around the world is trying to get more effective, more extensive use of, um, of accelerators to deal with these problems. There are lots of other areas where industry is already um, delivering everyday products, um, sterilization um, of hospital instruments, of packaging, of food. Accelerators are already being used for those purposes. Curing of plastics and inks. Again, many, many applications are already using um, an extensive array of accelerators to be able to get the right materials for applica application in our everyday lives. And in the semiconductor industry, as I say, every electronics device you will have will have gone through an accelerator at some stage in its life, um, which has required iron implantation for the electronics that are, that are embedded within it. If you look at the array of accelerators, and I say, I say it in use today, but in reality, this is the survey that was done by the APAE in 2017. Um, you can see the, the number of accelerators that are currently uh, utilized at that time across all of these um, application sectors. And we've heard already this morning 30,000. Well, this assessment was done in 2017 and it was already approaching 40,000. This is growing um, to a very high degree year on year in terms of uh, the need for utilizing accelerators more and more in new areas as, be as they become more prominent. And the products that, that, are, that are essentially generated as a consequence of using accelerators is phenomenal. Um, it's estimated that over 500 billion pounds of products a year um, need accelerators to go into the marketplace. And this is growing, again, extensively year on year. So the impact for accelerators uh, that accelerators are having is massive. Um, and it's applying to our economy, to our health, and our, our well-being every day. This just then highlights the recommendations that were made by both uh, the American um, group and the, and the European group, uh, remembering that there's a, there's a uh, seven year or so differential between the two, but a lot of the recommendations are very similar in relation to what the key priorities are seen to be needed kind of moving forward with accelerators. Reliability, beam power, um, higher gradients in a smaller footprint, um, reducing costs. Um, what we've seen in the, in the more recent report from the APAE, again, higher efficient accelerators using superconducting technologies, using lasers, making things simpler, reduce cost, higher efficiency, and making things mobile, easier, be it finding ways to easy, more easily transplant accelerators in different locations as a function of where they're needed. And both of these groups highlight that big science has a major role to play in all of this and being able to take advantage of new technologies as they're being developed for the likes of LHC, for the likes of large-scale free electron lasers around the world. Those same technologies can be transplanted in the industrial sector. And I'll show you some examples of where that's already being done. And this is one from, um, from again, another very large-scale um, facility development, uh, the Compact Linear Collider, which is a close to 50-kilometer-sized uh, machine 
um, but it uses very, very high performance accelerators, aren't identified, the, the kind of state of the art at the moment with conventional technologies is around 100 megavolts per meter. These are the devices that are doing that at the moment and this has taken decades of development to be able to achieve this level of performance. And so looking at how this technology can then be translated, um, CERN have collaborated with an industrial group in Europe, uh, the Terra Foundation, and looked at how these accelerator technologies can then be utilized in a commercial and industrial sector for, for medical um, therapy application. Um, and so, so they look then to be able to translate all of the design and fabrication technologies to provide an extremely compact accelerator that can be used in a hospital environment. And this is the process that they've conducted. So everything that they've done for CLIC in terms of understanding the fundamental physics uh, of high gradient accelerators, being able to design those cavities and structures and also build them from a practical perspective and then being able to validate them to high performance with, with test infrastructure. All of that has been utilized for this particular example um, such that for the 50 megavolt per meter target that they were needed for this accelerator, they were able to show within a very short um, period of time that they could achieve that accelerating gradient with an acceptable level of breakdown performance. So there's one example where very high, high um, investment cost for a massive scale machine can be translated to a very small practical implementation from an industrial perspective. In addition to the accelerator, there's also the RF power systems that are needed. And again, the same accelerator in terms of high power RF amplifiers can be a, an ideal solution for application in this, in this compact medical accelerator system. And so again, another area where these advantages can be taken um, clearly into, in terms of fundamental benefit. From my perspective, um, as I say, 12 miles away from here, we have a, a, an accelerator called the Versatile Electron Linear Accelerator. This is a, a flexible accelerator platform whereby academic and industrial users can utilize and develop new capabilities, develop new ca um, technologies, and fundamentally take that out then into the commercial sector. Um, this just shows the, the kind of platform we have for this high performance um, um, accelerator um, platform. It's, a, it's an S-band RF accelerator with a series of diagnostics to be able to feed beams into two user enclosures where, where groups can come along and then utilize. And this is just some of the parameters that we have available, um, which allows energies up to 6 MeV to be provided at, uh, at relatively low beam emittances and uh, low repetition rates. This is just then one example that we've been able to demonstrate with industry in the security sector um, and this is with RapiScan Systems. Anyone who's come here for this meeting from an international location will have come through Liverpool or Manchester airports. You'll have gone through a RapiScan scanner. Um, your, car, your baggage will have gone through one of their systems as well. Um, and so this company wants to be able to develop the next generation of scanners um, utilizing accelerators. And what they wanted to do was look at a way in which they could have both the radiation source and the detectors all in the same plane for the device that they want to be able to scan. Um, and so the beauty of the accelerator that we had in, at Darsbury with Vela allows us to, to provide high performance um, electron beams which can generate pencil x-rays um, which then is when fed onto a sample if, if uh, the backscattered uh, radiation can be appropriately measured and then this gives the, the researchers the ability to characterize what is in the, in the component that they want to be able to analyze. All of this is fundamentally driven by the performance of the detector. So again, RapiScan are working very closely with high performance uh, scintillator detector developers to be able to get the responsiveness that they need to be able to characterize these type of devices. Now, when they came to see us about this, this problem, they didn't know whether they could achieve the performance that they needed for this type of this new type of technique. And I just show you here what we had in place on Vela with regards to the electron beam coming in, a tungsten target, and X-rays feeding into the experimental hall 
that could then be used to, um, to detect on the, on the detection system. And this just shows you some of the preliminary results that we've been able to obtain. So the timing information from the detector gives them the measure of position, and the amplitude that they measure on the detector gives them the, um, an indication of the density. And so they're able to see clear differentials with regards to the type of substances that they want to be able to interrogate as, as, a, as a function of this process. So for a first test, this was really important for them to see that this was a, this was a viable process for them. The next test that they want to be able to do on Vela is to introduce more detectors and be able to do tomographical and 3D imaging of components that they typically need to be able to interrogate. In the same way as be in, at, the, at the same time, improve the performance of the detectors themselves with the industries that they're engaged with. The other example that I just want to show is again another application of big science um, and how at CERN they've been able to develop advanced technologies. This is a, a radio frequency quadrupole that was developed for the new injector for the high luminosity program on LHC at CERN. Um, what they've been able to do is to translate this large um, structured design, which delivers very high performance for what they need on LHC, to essentially a miniature version that can then be utilized in a more compact environment. Um, and this device is now being utilized in, in industry. Um, so in collaboration with advanced oncotherapy, this device is being used as a new type of, of particle therapy accelerator. Um, it, it will operate with proton beams up to 5 MeV. And at Darsbury, we will be the, the location for this first demonstrator, um, which, will, will, which will take place over the next couple of years. The, the group at CERN are also collaborating um, with the Cultural, Her Cultural Heritage Network um, at INFN. And again, utilizing this RFQ technology is utilizing a compact accelerator for non-invasive diagnostic studies um, for, um, for historical um, artifacts or work of art. So again, you can kind of see how big science is directly impacting in the commercial arena in, a, in an active way. The final area I just want to highlight is a program that is currently running in Europe, um, which is the AREAS, um, the Accelerator Research and Innovation for European Science and Society. Um, essentially, this program is tasked to develop applications and ideas for um, academic and industrial utilization of particle accelerators. And these are the three themes, excellence, access, innovation, and sustainability. For access, this comprises a number of accelerator platforms that have been made available under this program for groups to be able to utilize, um, develop ideas, demonstrate capabilities, and hopefully then translate those processes into the commercial environment. And so this process, um, in terms of transnational access, encompasses a number of accelerator platforms in com which, which will deal with magnet testing, material testing, electron and proton beam testing, radio frequency testing, and plasma beam testing. In total, 14 um, accelerator um, uh, solutions are embedded within this framework. And I'll just give you an insight into, into two of these with regards to the electron and proton beams and also the plasma, plasma beams. So with regards to electron and proton beams, there are five facilities that are being made available. Um, the, the CARA, um, CLUT, EFI, SIMBAD, and VELA accelerators. And they are all, all being utilized to be able to develop instrumentation, beam optics, RF systems, accelerator components, and low energy beam um, uh, proton, utilizing low energy beam protons and electron beams. This just then is, is some basic information for these accelerators, for the CARA facility at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Essentially, it uses the anchor synchrotron for the development of superconducting insertion devices, um, high performance synchronization systems, and beam diagnostics and analysis. The CLUT facility is a, is a modest energy, 40 MeV electron um, accelerator, and this serves as a test bench for new diagnostic methods. Again, um, extremely high performance synchronization systems and new diagnostics and utilization of these sort of um, technologies. 
The EFI facility in Sa at Saclay in France is a, is a high intensity proton beam, which again provides ability to test new diagnostics. It also generates neutrons. So, so again, the, the basic use of neutrons can be utilized by industrial partners in terms of uh, new materials, for example. And then the final facility I'd like to highlight is the, is the Sinbad facility at DAISY. Um, which, was, which is being built at the moment, and this will provide very short electron bunches for ultra-fast science. So, um, again, opportunities to use the type of science that was being explained earlier in terms of uh, femtosecond and even attosecond uh, generation radiation sources using plasma-based uh, acceleration, and this facility will be available in 2019. And the other facility, finally, is the Darsby facility, which I've already, I've already highlighted. The final areas I just want to highlight, then, are the plasma beam um, facilities. And there are three uh, platforms that have been made available. Um, the UHI, Laser Plasma Accelerator, at Saclay. The Lulal facility in Lund. And the Apollon facility at CNRS. Um, and again, just some basic um, information on these facilities. The UHI facility um, has uh, an ability to develop um, the plasma electrons up to 200 MeV um, and be able to then characterize these electrons in terms of how they can then be utilized. In a similar way at Lulal, um, they're able to um, develop the plasma electron um, beams and using the same processes up to 100 MeV um, and again using very high intensity lasers. And then the final facility is the Apollon facility at CNRS. Again, utilizing um, the same technologies and capabilities. This has two petawatt scale lasers um, that are able to generate long focus and short fo focus experimental um, um, opportunities, um, operating with electron beams up to 200 MeV. Um, and I note here that the that the energy spread is, is, is predicted to be approaching what's needed for conventional free electron lasers, um, which is, again, a, a very um, important mechanism for, for these type of accelerators. And I just highlight that this process is open, so all of those platforms are accessible. If groups need to use them, there's a registration process you can enter into, um, and, and certainly the groups who are, who are offering these facilities are there to help in terms of provisioning for those experiments. And so finally, I'd just like to say, in, with regards to um, what we can now see with, in terms of the impact and the importance of accelerators, what I've hoped I've been able to do is to make industry a bit more prominent in terms of uh, what we see as, as needing to be the fundamental benefit that industry can give to us um, from a societal perspective, um, but also in terms of taking advantage of key technologies as they're being developed. So thank you very much.